I was born at Soham, Cambridgeshire, England on the 20th of November, 1844. My parents were in good circumstances, and nothing of any note troubled or disturbed the peace of our happy family until the spring of 1849, when the Latter-day Saints, or Mormons as they were commonly called, made their appearance in the town, began holding meetings and preaching the gospel as taught by our Savior when he was here on earth. My mother, on hearing about the Mormon missionaries, attended their meetings and became very much impressed with the truth of the message they bore. Her growing interest in the newly established church brought forth bitter anger and countless reproaches against her, not only from my father, but from her parents as well. They thought she was bringing disgrace upon the family, and my father became so enraged about it that he finally brought our former minister to talk to her. And together they labored long and diligently to persuade mother to retrace her steps and leave the detestable doctrine alone. The minister's efforts were all to no purpose, however, for mother continued her attendance at the meetings and very soon became a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. At this, the anger of my father and also my mother's parents knew no bounds, and they insisted that she either stop going to the meetings of the saints or seek another home. The cruel choice between religion and home and husband now lay before my mother and must have proven a very trying one to her aching heart. Her faith in the hereafter, however, proved stronger than all earthly ties, for she clung with tenacity to the doctrine she had embraced and knew to be right. Previous to this time, my father and mother had lived together in perfect happiness, peace, and quietness, pervading our home. But now, oh, how sadly were things changed. My father, in his uncontrollable rage, beat and abused the wife he had loved so tenderly before, and for no other reason except her belief in the truth of the gospel, as taught by what he considered the horrid Mormons. Join anything, but keep away from them, he would often say. His bitterness against them was so great. I had great cause to love and respect my mother, as every child should do, and often wept at seeing her beaten and otherwise cruelly treated by my father. Daily his anger grew more intense, until one morning in a fit of rage he commanded her to either renounce the church forever or leave the house. Upon her refusal to comply with the former, he opened the door, and with her entreaties ringing in his ears, unrelentingly shoved her into the street, a homeless outcast. Poor mother, with a baby in her arms, and myself the oldest, clinging to her skirts, bent her steps towards my grandfather's, leaving the other child, my younger brother, with father. My grandparents, having always been very kind, we felt assured of a welcome from them. Judge, therefore, of the bitter disappointment when we met nothing but angry reproaches and were refused even the shelter of the house. This was indeed a sad blow to my grief-stricken mother, with two little children and no place to lay her head. Turned like a criminal from the doors that should receive her with such gladness, we felt very downcast indeed. No one seemed to have any sympathy for us, as but few had possessed sufficient courage to join the church, even though their convictions pointed toward that channel, on account of the bitterness existing against it. My mother at length found shelter for the night with a family who had joined the church and all who had ever been placed in trying circumstances will understand with what gratitude it was accepted.
My mother now had no one except her Heavenly Father and her own weak efforts to rely on. Accordingly, early the next morning, with me by her side and the babe held closely in her arms, she bent her steps toward the city of London to seek, as many as have done before and since, on its crowded thoroughfares and stifling shops or well-filled factories, a penny to buy a loaf of bread. I remember how I pled with her, between my sobs, with tearful eyes, not to go to London, where we might starve, but to return to my father and live as we had done previous to our trouble. Her answer was, No, my boy, I will never give up what I believe to be the truth. No, not for all the homes of this world. In due time, after many hardships, we reached the great city, with its throngs of people, many of whom seemed to be in as sad a plight as we were, without friends or money. Mother had three sisters living there, all in good circumstances, and amply able to aid us without the least convenience. After some little search, they were found, but as the letters of my grandparents had imparted the home news, and bitterness as well, we found no welcome, but from each place were coldly turned away. Not knowing what to do with two children in a large city, Mother at last persuaded one of her sisters to give me shelter until she was able to provide a home for me. To see her and my little brother going away was a great trial for me and filled my painfully throbbing heart with unspeakable grief. But there was no help for it. Mother wandered about several days, living very poorly, obtaining a little food as best she could until she obtained work at a tailoring establishment. And although the pay was small and the hours that she sat at her needle were very long and tedious, it was more than acceptable, as it furnished support for herself and little one. In all this trouble the Lord blessed her with a cheerful heart, and she toiled diligently on, fixing up her little room to be quiet, comfortable, and homelike and after a few weeks had slipped away, to my great joy took me to share her humble lodging, which was poor indeed compared to the home father had made for us, but we felt very happy in it. I soon began to want to help my mother, thinking it probable I might do something to lighten her labors. So one day we started out to look for a situation for me. After looking for some time, we saw a card in a shop window reading, Boy Wanted. When we applied, the proprietor looked at me and smiled, saying I was too small, but gave me a penny. After trying several places, Mother obtained a situation for me at a stationer's. My duty there was to watch the newsstand outside from 8 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock in the evening, for the sum of two shillings and six pence per week. Mother to board and clothe me. I can assure you, though, I felt very proud to take my week's wages home to my mother, small as the amount was. Nor was I alone in my pride, for well I remember how the tears ran down her dear face as she kissed me and said, God bless you, my boy. I think that was one of the happiest evenings of my life. About this time, a branch of the Mormon Church was established at Great Cambridge Street, Hackney Road, London, called the Hagerston Branch. And again, my mother had the privilege of meeting with those of her own faith. This caused her to feel more cheerful and happy. But soon a new trouble arose. My father made his appearance in London and began to harass and annoy Mother with constantly trying to persuade her to renounce the doctrines he so detested, and return with him to their home. 
As she persistently refused, his persecutions became almost unbearable. Until one day he tried to take me to my old home by force. I made a vigorous protest against this indignity, and with mother's assistance came off victorious. This affair caused me much trouble of mind, for as yet a little spark of love and respect for my father remained, and it seemed very strange that my parents, who once lived happily together in our village home, should now be enemies. Mother became very much alarmed, lest father should again try to take me away, as it was a source of great anxiety as I had become her great friend, companion, and helper. She therefore sought for me other employment, finding it at a druggist. My duty here consisted of keeping the place clean, running errands and sometimes working at the mortar. I found it an agreeable change, my hours shorter, the work less tedious, and my remuneration sixpence per week more. My master also made me little presents of clothing, that I might appear neat and tidy in the shop. I worked at this place for some time. My master was very kind to me, and I became much attached to him. By some means my father again learned of my whereabouts, and though I did not like to leave, mother thought it safest for me to change. I next commenced to work at a tailoring establishment on Bishopgate Street as an errand boy, getting the same wages as formerly. My master soon increased my wages to three shillings and sixpence, for which I was extremely grateful. The lady of the house was also kind and good, often giving me a basket with nice food in to take home to my mother and occasionally articles of clothing that were found very useful. About this time, my mother became desirous that I should be baptized, and after talking to me on the subject, and at last arrangements were made with one Brother Owens, president of the Hagerston branch, who baptized me. This was April 1853. Mother was still afraid of father taking me away from her, and one day asked me how I would like to go to Utah. The idea was very pleasant indeed, and I thought it would be fine to ride on the train and the ship such a long, long way, little dreaming of the hardships I would have to pass through, and of the lonesome time away from my mother in a strange land. I readily signified my desire to go, and Mother immediately began saving as much from her earnings as we could possibly spare to pay my fare. Many sacrifices were required before the desired amount was obtained, and when it was finally accomplished and the goal of our thoughts and hearts within reach, Mother's heart failed her at the thought of separation. In despair, she would say, my boy, I cannot let you go after all. I may never see you again. Then she would cheer up and say, We shall not long be parted. I shall soon follow you. In the spring of 1855, arrangements were made with a gentleman coming out to take care of me. At length the time arrived for me to take leave of my mother and go alone over the stormy sea. On the morning of the 6th of April, 1855, after a sad, sad farewell, I took the train from Euston Station to Liverpool. And on the 12th of the same month, we sailed on the Samuel Curlin for New York, landing in safety after a voyage of 31 days. This was the first shipload of saints to land at that port. We traveled by rail to Pittsburgh, from here to St. Louis by boat, then to Atchison, or Mormon Grove, as it was then more commonly called. The city of Atchison, Kansas, with its fine buildings as it now stands, 
could hardly be associated in one's mind with the wild timbered country we saw then. We left the grove early in July, the company consisting of 34 wagons, mostly drawn by oxen. Moses Thurston was captain. I found it very hard crossing the plains and began to think more seriously of my mother and brother in London, almost wishing I was back with them, though many of the brethren were very kind to me. On the 19th of September, we arrived in Salt Lake City. The brother I came out with moved into the country north, leaving me in the city. However, I fell into good hands. Brother George Openshaw, who lived in the 19th Ward, took me in for the winter, and was indeed kind to me, though I was too small to help him much. That year grasshoppers had taken nearly everything, so he had very little for his own family. But as long as the flower lasted, I shared it with them. Very often, though, we went hungry. Living for days together on the few sagos we could dig on the bench. Not very nourishing, surely to a famishing boy, but nevertheless highly acceptable then. Nothing else could be obtained. I well remember one day, as I was digging over the potato patch, to see if I could not find some potatoes that had been overlooked and lain all winter, when I heard someone calling me. I looked up and saw Mrs. John Haslam, a neighbor who was motioning for me to go to her. To my great surprise and unspeakable joy, she gave me two large slices of bread and some meat. None but those who have suffered the gnawing pangs of hunger can realize how delicious was the taste of that food. It was the most thankfully received of any present I ever remember being the recipient of. Thoughts of mother, brother, and home now began to crowd thick and fast on my lonely little heart. And many a night my pillow was wet with tears, as visions of the happy fireside and well-filled table of the days long past floated through my mind. I had grown thin from want of food. My clothing had become nothing but rags. My feet had been bare for months. And I must indeed have been a pitiable sight to poor mother if she had been permitted to gaze on her forlorn boy. Brother Openshaw, not being able to care for me longer himself, now advised me to go and see if Bishop Hunter could not find me a place. So one morning early in April I started out. But when I had proceeded as far as the southeast corner of the temple block, the sense of my desolate position came over me so strongly that I lost all courage and sat down unable to control my sobs or keep back the blinding tears. How I wished I could write to mother and tell her of my misery, my rags, and the gnawing, biting hunger that almost consumed every other thought. But no, even that comfort was denied, as I had never learned to write, being too young while our home was happy and united, and having to help earn my bread at the age I should have been in school. Perhaps this was a blessing after all, because the knowledge of my suffering would have only added to her already weighty burden of trouble. While sitting here, Brother John B. Mabin, who knew Mother and myself in England, came along and inquired the cause of my distress. I related my story to him. When he took me home, provided me with a good breakfast and kindly told me as I departed that if I found no other home, his would be open to me. I wandered back to the 19th Ward, and it being a warm day, I sat down on the ditch bank, 
on account of the great uncertainty which way to direct my steps, and began amusing myself. I had not been there long when a man who was plowing in a lot close by called to and inquired what was my name and why I sat there so disconsolately. I told him my conditions, and in broad scotch he said, Well, man, come away over the fence and take thy stick and drive the cattle for me. I complied with alacrity, and when noon came he told his good wife all about the boy. After a consultation they informed me I could stay with them, as they had cornbread and milk in plenty. In the fall, however, he became dissatisfied and went back to Iowa. Once more I felt friendless and alone, the longing to hear from my mother coming with renewed vigor. Was she dead, sick, or in trouble, that she did not send me one word of love or comfort? These questions racked me sorely, but no word came to end my suspense until the spring of 1857, when my mother advertised for me in the Deseret News, and also spoke to a gentleman coming out to look me up and write to her of my whereabouts. This he did, but it proved of no benefit to me, as he and his family were very unkind, often abusing me. I had to labor very, very hard, early and late, getting no remuneration whatever. My own clothing was by this time completely exhausted, and the wardrobe he furnished was not very extensive, consisting of jeans, cap, factory shirt of curious color and make, an old pair of my master's pants, with the bottoms cut off, and the whole completed with a leather belt around my waist in place of suspenders. Oh, by the way, I only possessed the one shirt so was forced to retire to my couch when it was washed. Thus poorly clad, I had to go alone to the canyon for wood, with a pair of shoes on my sockless feet that the young man of today would not be seen wearing. One day, I went to Red Butte Canyon for a load of wood that the man I stayed with had bargained to sell to someone in another part of the city. While I was gone, it both rained and snowed, so that when I arrived at the place I was to deliver the wood, I was in a very sorry plight, drenched to the skin by the rain, and suffering intensely from the cold. The gentleman who received the wood looked at me with pity, and asked if I had been sent to the canyon in that condition. I told him I had. After the wood was unloaded and said, Take the cattle home and feed them. Then come back to me and I will see what I can do for you. Needless to say, I readily complied. I thought any change could not be a worse one. He proved a very friend in need, furnishing me with respectable clothing and shoes as soon as he could get them, besides giving me the best home I had known for a long time. The family were very kind to me, and I felt very comfortable and as happy as it was possible to be, when so far away from mother and dear ones. This was the spring of the year the people moved south, and the city for a time was almost deserted, only a guard of a few hundred men being left in it, in readiness to burn everything in case of necessity. My friend, being a prominent businessman, with his interest in the city, did not move his family away, and I stayed with them for company. One day while in the garden, we heard great cheering and commotion on another street, now known as First South about Fourth East. The lady became very much alarmed, fearing the soldiers had suddenly come into the city. I quickly ran to ascertain the cause of the disturbance and relieve her anxiety. Upon arriving at the corner, I saw about 100 men on horseback and a train of pack animals with them. The men were in civilian clothes, so I stopped until they rode up, 
when I recognized among them Brother William Kimball, whom I had known in London. To my unutterable joy he had a letter from my mother. I learned then that my mother was well, and also what made me sad, in spite of what happened, the death of my father. Further on, the letter from my mother said, I expect to go to Boston sometime during the summer. This was the crowning of my joy. It seemed too good to be true. I said to myself over and over again in a paroxysm of delight. The trouble with the government being settled shortly after this, people moved from the south. Food and clothing became much more plentiful, and times brightened up considerably. The family I resided with took great pains to teach me to read and write, and also a little about arithmetic. I lived thus very happily with them until the fall of 1860, when my mother came to the valley. And I had the great pleasure of again seeing her dear face, and being reunited with my two brothers. This was to me one of the most joyful occasions of my life. Shortly after, mother moved north to the Weber River, where she had friends, and I hired out there for the year. In the spring, however, she moved back into Salt Lake, thinking she would be more likely to get work at her trade. The man I was working for went to Box Elder County about this time, where I accompanied him, remaining until the spring of 1864, when I was called to drive a team across the plains. I afterwards worked for President Woodruff three months, at the expiration of which time the man I had gone north with came after me, and I returned to Box Elder County with him, working out by the year until the spring of 1867, when, after a happy courtship, in which the old, old story became new again, I married Miss Elizabeth Welch. We lived in a little log house on some land I rented. My furniture was rather scant, as everything was so high-priced at that time, and I had my own way to make entirely. The Lord blessed me with a good wife, however, who was both economical and industrious, and we struggled on in unity and contentment for a few years. When I built a log house on my own land, hauling the logs and doing most of the work myself. It was indeed a great pleasure when we first became ensconced in our neat little home, with our three healthy boys around us, and we felt that Providence had favored us with his smiles. The first ten years of our married life I spent at farming, and at the end of that period was called by President Snow of Brigham City to travel with my team to buy produce and sell groceries in the interest of the Brigham City Co-op. I hesitated considerably at the idea of this, because it looked like making a peddler of myself, the very thought of which was extremely distasteful to me. I tried to induce President Snow to release me, but all to no purpose, so I laid the matter before my mother, soliciting her advice. Her answer was, I do not like to see you make a hawker of yourself, but I believe, my boy, I would try. All will come out right in the end. Accordingly, I began the necessary preparations, and in a few days actually started out. The first day was a very sorry one for a beginning, as I had only taken in twenty cents. I started home disgusted with my occupation, determined to find Brother Snow and resign at once. When Brother Snow had heard me through, he remarked, Well, which would we rather do? Take a mission to your native land or continue on with this? The mission to my native land, I replied quickly. Ah, well, he said, try this first and the mission afterward. I again started out but felt very disheartened and indifferent about it, not caring if the results were satisfactory or not, 
thinking then to be the sooner relieved of what I considered a very unenviable position. Before long, however, I began to see it was of no avail to shirk my duty. So I began in earnest, and although I found it rather uphill work, not having any education except the little I had picked up now and then, the Lord prospered me. And in three years, I was put in superintendent of the cooperative store in Brigham City, where I remained seven years, giving, I believe, entire satisfaction to my employers. I was called from here in the fall of 1884 on a two years mission to England. Accordingly, I put my affairs in order, resigned my position, and bidding a sad farewell to my wife, four sons and two daughters, I left my dear, comfortable home and started to preach the gospel. I felt keenly the parting of my dear, loved wife and little ones. Also from my mother, whose health was very poor, on account of a paralytic stroke she had received the spring before. She was very proud, though. She said to see me go back to her friends with the glad message of life and salvation. I very much feared, notwithstanding her cheerfulness, our goodbye would be one of life, though I hoped for the best. After a pleasant journey of some 16 days, we landed in Liverpool on the 29th of October, 1884, where we met Brother John H. Smith at the Old Quarters, 42 Islington Street. It was a cold, wet, dreary day and looked rather cheerless to a homesick missionary. After a sojourn of one night at the office, I was assigned to labor in the London Conference and immediately left for that place. On arriving at London, I was given the privilege of visiting my relatives. The old-time bitterness against the Mormons still existed, the only difference being in the positions I occupied and with myself. The first time I had gone with my mother to plead for shelter, now I came independent, but as a minister of the doctrines they held in such abhorrence. We had a very pleasant visit, talking over old times, but my relatives would not even listen to a word of the gospel as taught by the Latter-day Saints, and strictly enjoined me to leave no books lying around, for fear some of the servants might see them, and learn they were sheltering a Mormon which they felt would prove a great disgrace. After visiting my native town and the scenes of my boyhood, I started my labors in the Burtz and Wilts district, where I had been assigned all alone, and at first felt very much my inability to accomplish anything of worth in this vast field. So I sincerely prayed to the Lord to bless me with His Spirit, and fit and prepare me for this great and noble work. The Lord heard my prayers and truly blessed me, inasmuch as I was the means in His hands of bringing many an honest heart to the knowledge of the truth, some of whom are now happily settled in their own homes here in the valleys of the mountains. After I had been absent a little over two years, I was released from my mission and returned home. I found my family all well and prospering, but my dear mother had passed away 15 months before my return. I often think how much better our young people would appreciate their conditions in life if they had to pass through the trials and hardships many of their parents have done. Instead of murmuring, their voices would oftener be raised in praise and thanksgiving to God for His mercies and blessings bestowed upon them.